evening <laughs> entertainment, <laughs> other amusements were reserved for the evening, while revelry was again held in the great hall, while the table roared for the third time since morning, with good cheer and the ruby wine, which seemed to gush from inexhaustible fountain, mantled in the silver flagon, while senachal, sewer and pantler, the young men of the and the kitchen were again actually engaged in their vocations, while of 300 guests more than half as if in Sakiate again vied with each other in prowess with the trencher and the goblet. While in the words of old Taylor, the water poet, who was no water drinker and who thus sang of the hospitality of the men of Manchester in the early part of the 17th century, they had roast boiled bait to too much wine, claret sack, nothing they thought too heavy or too hot. Can follow can pots of seed hot. During this time, preparations were making for fresh entertainments out of doors. The gardens at Horton Tower, though necessarily confined in space, owing to their situation on the brow of a hill, were beautifully laid out and commanded from their illustrious terraces, magnificent views of the surrounding country. Below them lay the well wooded park skirted by the silvery Darwin, the fair village of Walton the Dale, immediately beyond the proud town of Reston Barbaron, and the single corn nest point rising majestically in the distance. The principal garden constituted a square and was divided with mathematical precision according to the former taste of the time into smaller squares with a broad well kept gravel walk at each angle. These plots were arranged in various figures and devices such as the pink foil, the flower, the bus, the trim foil, the lozenger, the fret, the diamond, the crossbow, and the oval, all very elaborate and intricate in design. Besides these knots, as they were termed, they were labyrinths and clip and that indispensable requisite to a garden at a period a maze in the centre with a rusty eminence surmounted by a pavilion in front of which spread a grass plot of smoothest turf ordinarily used as a ballroom. At the lower end of this, a temporary stage was erected for the masquerade about to be represented for the king. Torches were kindled and numerous lamps burned in the branches of the adjoining trees. They were scarcely needed for the moon being at the full the glorious effulgence shed by her upon the scene rendered all over light pale and ineffectual. After supper, at which the drinking was deeper than at dinner, the whole of the revellers repaired to the garden, full of frolic and merriment, and well disposed for any diversion in store for them. The king was conducted to the bowling green by his horse, preceded by a crowd of attendants bearing order with various torches, the royal gaze being somewhat unsteady. The aid of Sir Gilbert Orton's arm was required to keep a monarch from stumbling. The rest of the fat Hanalians followed, and elated as they were, it will not be wondered that they put very little restrained upon themselves, but shouted, sang, danced, and indulged in all sorts of license. Opposite the stage, prepared for the masquerers, a platform had been reared, in front of which was a chair for the king, with seats for the nobles and principal guests behind it. The sides were hung with curtains of crimson velvet, fringed with gold, the roof decorated like a canopy, so that it had a very magnificent effect. James lolled back in his chair, and jested loudly, and rather indecorously, with the various personages as they took their place around him in less than five minutes. The hall of the green was filled with revellers, and great was the pushing and jostling, the laughing and screaming that ensued among them. Silence was then enjoined by Sir John Finney, who had stationed himself on the steps of the stage, and at this command the assembly became comparatively quiet, though now and then a half suppressed titter or a smothered scream would break out. Amid this silence, the king's voice could be distinctly heard, and his hoarse guests received the ears of the astonished audience, provoking many a severe comment from the elders and a much secret laughter from the juniors. The masquerade began to to tell the deities appeared on the stage. They were followed by a band of foresters clad in Lincoln green with paws at their back. First deity wore a white linen tunic with flesh coloured paws and red skins and had a purple taffeta mantle over his shoulders in his hand he held a palm branch and a garland of the same leaves was woven around his brow. The second household god was a big grown violet, wild and shaggy in appearance, being clothed in the skins of beasts with sandals of untanned cowhide. On his head was a garland of oak leaves, and from his neck on that horn he was armed with a hunting spear and wooden knife, and attended by a large Lancashire mastiff. Advancing to the front of the stage, all more personage thus addressed the monarch. This day, great king, for government admired, which these thy subjects have so much desired, shall be kept all in their heart's best treasure, and vow to James, as is this month to Caesar. And now the landlord of this ancient tower, thrice fortunate to see this happy hour, whose trembling art thy
by presence set on fire unto this house the heart of all our shire does bid thee cordial welcome and would seek it in higher notes with extreme joy he'll break it he makes his guests most welcome in his eyes love's tears do sit not he that shouts and cries and we the antique guardians of this place i of this house he of the fruitful chase since the bold portents from the hill took name who with a sip unbridled saxons came and so have flourished in this fairer clime successively from that to this our time still offering up to our immortal powers sweet incense wine and odoriferous flowers while sacred vessa in a virgin tire with vows and wishes tender to hallowed fire now seeing that thy majesty is thus greater than household deities like us we render unto thy more powerful god this tower this night is thine he is thy ward for by thy helping and auspicious hand he and his form shall ever ever stand and flourish in the sight of envious fate and then live like augustus fortunate and long long mayest thou live to which both men and guardian angels cry james who had demeaned himself critically during the delivery of the address observed at his clause to sir richard Horton, who was standing immediately behind his chair we cannot say meekle for the rhymes which are but indifferently strung together but the sentiments are leal and good and that is how uh, we care for on this the second to the left divinity advanced and throwing himself into an attitude as if bewildered by the august presence in which he stood exclaimed thou greatest of mortals and then stopped as if utterly confounded the king looked at him for a moment and then roared out well good man your commencement is pertinent and true enough and though we be the greatest of mortals as ye style us dinner bash yourself out our grandeur but go on and this if we were no better than no wiser than your own simple self instead of encouraging the dumbfounded and dread detail this speech completely upset him he hastily retreated and in trying to swing himself behind the huntsman fell back from the stage and his hound leapt after him incident whether premeditated or not amused the spectators much more than any speech he could have delivered and the king joined heartily in the merriment silence began again this so diverse divinity came forward once more and spoke thus dread lord thy majesty have stricken dumb his weaker godhead if to himself he come unto thy service straight he will commend these foresters and charge them to attend thy pleasure in this part and show such sport to the chief huntsman and thy princely court as the small circle of this round affords and be more ready than he was in words well spoken and to the purpose fellow cried him and we take this opportunity of assuring our worthy host in the presence of his other guests that we have never had better sport in park or forest than we have this day enjoyed have never eaten better cheer nor quaff better wine than at his board and altogether have never been more hospitably well sir richard was overwhelmed by his majesty's commendation i have done nothing my gracious league he said to merit much acknowledgement on your part and the delight i experience is only tempered by my utter unworthiness who to demand replied james jocularily you merit a vast deal more than we have said you good for dinner always get their desserts can that sir richard and now have ye not some other drolleries in store for us the baronet replied in that affirmation and the soon afterwards the stage was occupied by a new class of performers and a drollery commenced which kept the audience in one continual roar of laughter so long as it lasted and yet none of the parts had been studied actors entirely trust into their own powers of comedy to carry it out the principal character was the cap justice enacted by sir john finnick who took occasion in the course of the performance to lampoon and satirize most of the eminent legal characters of the day, mimicking the voices and manner of the justices, Crook, Orton, and Doddridge, so admirably that his hearers were well nigh convulsed, and the three learned gentlemen who sat near the king, though fully conscious of the ridicule high them, were obliged to laugh with the rest, but the unfairing satirist was not content with this, but went on with most of the other attendants upon the king, and being intimately versed in court scandal, he directed his lash with telling effect, as a contrast to the malicious pleasantry of the cat justice, were the gambles and guests of Robin Goodfellow, a merry him who, if he led people into mischief, was already ready to get them out of it. Then there was a dance by Bill Buckler, Old Crambo, and Tom Bedlam, the half-crazed individual already mentioned as being among the crowd in the base court. This was applauded to the echo, and consequently repeated. But the most diverting scene of all was that in which Jem Tosspot and the Beatle Wango appeared, though given in the broadest vernacular of the county, and scarcely intelligible to the whole of the company. The dialogue of this part of the piece was so like like and natural that everyone recognised its truth while the situations arranged with the slightest effort and on the spur of the moment were extremely ludicrous. The scene was 
supposed to take place in the small Lancashire alehouse where a jovial pedder was carousing and where being visited by his three sweethearts, each of whom he privately declared to be the favourite, he had to reconcile their differences and keep them all in good humour. Familiar with the character in all its aspects, Nicholas played it to the life and to them justice. Dames Baldwin, Tet Low and Nance Redfern were but little if at all inferior to him. There was a reality in their jealous quarrelling that gave infinite zest to the performance. So Oh my body it's slim James admiringly. Those are the bro woman and of them man the sax feet if she is an inch and well made and well favoured too. Sounds, Sir Richard, there's no standing in the spells of your Lancashire witches. High born and low born, they are alike. I would their only witchcraft lay in their end. I should then have the less fear of them, but have you old ma for it is rolling late, and you can we have something to do in that pavilion? Only a merry dance, my leech, in which I man will here in a then draw logical foilage of fronds, replied Baronet. James laughed at the description, and soon afterwards a party of mummers, male and female, clad in various grotesque garbs, appeared on the stage, and the midst of them was the dendrological man enclosed in a framework of green paws like that one of a modern jack in the green. A ring was formed by the mummers, and the round commenced to lively music, while the mazy measure was proceeding. Nance Redfern, who had quitted the stage with Nicholas, and now stood close to him among the spectators, said in a low tone, Look there. The squire glanced in the direction indicated, and to his surprise and terror, distinguished among the crowd at a little distance the figure of a Cistercian monk. He is invisible to every eye except our own, whispered Anne, and is come to tell me it is time. Time for what? demanded Nicholas. Time for you to seize those two accursed devices. Jem and his mother, replied Nance. They are both on yon board. Jem is the man in the street, and Elizabeth is the old crown in the red kirtle and high round hat. You win no or for face when you look off the mat. The monk is gone, cried Nicholas. I have kept my eyes steadily fixed on him, and he is melted into air. What has he to do with the devices? He is their fate, returned Nan, and I have acting under his orders. Four mount and seize them, I win get with ya. Forcing his way through the crowd, Nicholas ran over the steps and followed by Nance sprang on the stage. His appearance occasioned considerable surprise, but as he was recognised by the spectators as the jolly Jem Tosspart, who had so recently diverted them and his companion as one of the three old wangles in anticipation of some more fun, they received him with a round of applause, but without stopping to acknowledge it, or being for a moment diverted from his purpose, Nicholas sees the old crone, and consigning her to Nance, called hold of the leafy frame in which the man was encased, and pulled him from under it, but he began to think he had unkenneled the wrong thoughts, but the man, though at all fell over, bore no resemblance to Jem Device, while when the crone's mask was looked off, she was found to be a comely young woman. Meanwhile, all around was in an uproar, and amidst a hurricane of hisses, yells, and other indications of displeasure from the spectators, several of the mummers demanded the meaning of such a strange and unwarrantable proceeding. They are a couple of witches, cried Nicholas. This is Jem Device and his mother Elizabeth. My name is not a Jem, no device, cried the man. No mine, Elizabeth, screamed the woman. We know the device, cried two or three voices, and these are none of them. Nicholas was perplexed. The storm increased. Threats accompanied the hisses. When luckily he spied a ring on the man's finger, he instantly seized his hand and held it up to a general gate. A proof, proof, he cried. This sapphire ring was given by the king to my cousin Richard Ashton this morning and stolen from him by Jem Device. Examine their features again, said Nancy Redfern, waving her hands over them. You win and know them now. The woman's face instantly altered, many years being added to it in a breath. The man changed equally. The utmost astonishment was evinced by all at the transformation, and the bystanders who had spoken before now cried out loudly. We know them perfectly now. They are the two devices. By this time, an officer, attended by a party of Albertiers, had mounted board and the two prisoners were delivered to their custody by Nicholas. Oh, cried the man, I will no longer deny my name. I am Jem Device, and this is my mother, Elizabeth, for I was a vendor than either on us stands for you. This woman is Nance Redfern, granddaughter of the old high Chatos. I charge her with making wax images and sticking pins in them with intent to kill all. Who would have killed me myself with her delivery if I hadn't been too strong for her? And that's why. Who bears me malice and has betrayed me to swine? Nicholas, I sees her and can me as a witness against her. And as Nance was secured, he laughed malignantly. I care 
and not plainness. I am now revenged on you all. While this impromptu performance took place as much to the surprise of James as of anyone else, and while he was desiring Sir Richard Horton to ascertain what it all meant at the very moment that two devices and Nance removed from the stage, an usher approached the monarch and said that Master Hotz entreated a moment's audience of his majesty. Hotz exclaimed James, somewhat confused, what is he? Ah yes, I recollect, a witch finder. Well, let him approach. Accordingly, the next moment the little attorney, whose face was evidently charged with some tremendous intelligence, was ushered into the king's presence. After a profound reverence, he said, may it please your majesty, I have something for your private ear. Oh well then, replied James, approach us more closely. What have you got to say, sir, old more, and then these witches? A great deal, sire, replied Potts in an impressive tone. Something dreadful has happened, something terrible. I what exclaimed James, looking alarmed. What is it, man? Speak murder, sire. Murder, being done, said Hart in a low, thrilling accent. Murder, exclaimed James, horror stricken. Tell us all about it, and without more ado. But Hart was still circumspect with an air of deepest mystery. He approached his head as near as he dared to that of the monarch and whispered in his ear, Can this be true? cried James. If say it's very shocking, very sad. If it's too true, as your majesty will find on investigation, replied Hart, the little girl, I told you all, can't advise so we don't. Well, well, there is no accounting for human frailty and weakness, said James. Let a necessary step be taken at once. We will consider what to do. But dear, here, sir, then I'll let the barn Jan go. Order fast, your man that now go and cause the guilty party to be put under arrest. And on receiving this man, my spots departed. Scarcely was he gone, then Nicholas Ashton came up to the railing of the platform and imploring his majesty's forgiveness for the disturbance he had occasioned, explaining that it had been owing to the seizure of the two devices who, for some wicked but unexplained purpose, had contrived to introduce themselves under various disguises into the tower. He did right to arrest the miscreants, sir, said James. But have you heard what has happened? No, my liege, replied Nicholas, along by the king's manner. What is it? Come nearer, and ye shall learn, replied James, for we would not have it through to draw. Though it's true, as we can doubt, it will be known soon enough. And as the squire bent forward, he imparted some intelligence to him, which instantly changed the expression of the latter to one of mingled horror and rage. It is false, sire, he cried. I will answer for her innocence with my life. She could not do it. Your majesty's patience is abused. It is Janet who has done it, not she. But I will unravel the terrible mystery. You have the other two wretches prisoners and can enforce the truth from them. We will essay to do so, replied James. But we have also another prisoner. Christopher Demdy, said Nicholas. Aye, Christopher Demdy, joined James. But another beside him, Mistress Nutter. You stare, sir. But it is true. She is in yonder. We can full well what assisted her flight and were concealed her. Master Potts has told us all. It is well for you that your pure kinsman, Richard Ashton, did us sick good service at the ball today. We shall not now be unmindful of it, even though he cannot send us the ring we gave him. It is here, sire, replied Nicholas. It was sold from him by the villain, Jem Device, for you've meant to use it for Alison. I am now delivering it to your majesty as coming from him in her behalf, and we shall receive it, replied the monarch brushing away the moisture that gathered thickly in his eyes. At this moment, a tall personage wrapped in a cloak who appeared to be an officer of the guard approached the railing. I am come to inform your majesty that Christopher Demby has just died of his wounds, said the personage, and so he has had a stray death after all, rejoined James. Well, we are sorry for it. His portion will be eternal bail, observed the officer. How know you that, sir, demanded the king sharply. You are not his judge. I witness his end, sire, replied the officer, and no man who died as he died can be saved. Fine was beside him at death's throes. Save us, exclaimed James. He did not say so, Evan Santi man, but this is gruesome and gars the flesh creep on one's veins. Let his foul carcass be taken away and hang it on a gibbet on the hill where Malkin Tower ain't stood as a warning to a senior's offenders. As the king ceased speaking, Master Potts appeared out of breath and greatly excited. She has escaped, sire, he cried. What, Janet? exclaimed James. If so, we will hang you in her seat. No, sire, Alison, replied Hotz. I can no way find her, no, and he hesitated. Well, well, it is no great matter, replied James, as if relieved, and with a glance of satisfaction at Nicholas, I know where Alison is, sire, said the officer. Indeed, exclaimed James, this fellow is strangely officious, he muttered to himself. And where may she be, sir, he added aloud. I will produce her within a quarter of an hour in yonder pavilion, replied the officer, and all that Master Hotz has been unable to find. Your Majesty may trust him, observed Nicholas, who had attentively regarded the officer.
officer. Depend upon it, he will make good his words. You think so, cried the king. Then we will put him to the test. You will engage to confront Alison with her mother, he added to the officer. I will, sire, replied the other, but I shall require the assistance of a dozen men. Cat twenty, if you will, replied the king. I am impatient to see what you can do. In a quarter of an hour, all shall be ready within the pavilion, sire, replied the officer. You have seen one in my swears, sire, but you shall now behold him on the master of death, and he disappeared. Nicholas felt sure he would accomplish his task, for he had recognised in him the Cisurian monk, where is Sir Richard Ashton of Middleton inquired the king. He left the tower with the daughter Dorothy immediately after the banquet, replied Nicholas. I am glad of it, right, right, replied the monarch. A terrible intelligence can be better welcome to them. If it had come upon them suddenly, it might have been fatal, especially to the pure lassie. Let Sir Ralph Ashton of Wally come to me, and Master Roger Norwell of Reed. Your Majesty shall be obeyed, replied Sir Richard Horton. The king then gave some instructions respecting the prisoners, and bade Master Potts have Janet in readiness, and now what you see what terrible thing had happened.